Hello and welcome to this uh, video clip going through uh, the Cambridge Chemistry Challenge uh, 2013 paper question 1. As I always say in my clips, um, it's not a mark scheme, but just some ideas from me about how I might go about um, tackling this particular question. So the actual papers themselves with their mark schemes and also exam commentaries can be found on www.c3l6.com. So in every single C3L6 paper, they have a box on the front that uh, talks you through um, some of the material and the fact that it will be beyond what you've looked at already. And uh, it also introduces the, the idea of deductive thinking and problem solving that you'll need to put into place uh, for this to work. Further down the page, they talk about um, how to lay out the calculations and how to, be, uh, how to use um, good mathematical common sense. So appropriate significant figures means the least sensitive number of sig figs as you find in the question, and always be careful of uh, your units. Another good tip is to always use the values that are provided in the periodic table that comes with the paper. So if you look at the, uh, the values for um, relative atomic mass in this particular periodic table, there are two decimal places, whilst most A-level exam boards use one decimal place in their data sheets. So stick to the values that are in this particular periodic table when you're doing your calculations. So this first question is about a chemical called phenylbutazone, which uh, was uh, associated with the horse meat scandal that uh, was in the news in 2013, the year of this paper. So the question gives some information about uh, phenylbutazone's precursor compound. Um, it gives you the structure of phenylbutazone and the mass spectrum of the precursor. So the first thing to do for the empirical formula is to divide the percentage by the relative atomic mass. And I'm using the values from the periodic table that I mentioned a couple of seconds ago. So dividing by the smallest in each case, we get 1 to 1.33 to 1.33. So multiplying each of those numbers by 3 to eliminate decimals or improper fractions... That gives us uh, C3H4O4. So, that means that our empirical formula must be C3H4O4. But looking at the mass spectrum a bit more closely, the molecular ion peak at MZ equals 104 is also equal to C3H4O4. It must mean the molecular formula is also C3H4O4. So moving on to part B, you'll notice I've actually taken the mass spectrum and put it onto this page as well, so we can refer to both if we need to. It says, use the IR spectrum of A to suggest which functional group it contains. So it's worth mentioning that uh, you won't get infrared data with your paper, so working knowledge of um, some of the functional groups are essential. So the extract below is from the OCR Chemistry A specification data sheet. So let's use it to answer question B. So which functional groups um, A contains? So we've got the OH stretch for carboxylic acid, we've got C double bond O, and we've got C single bond O. We've also got some peaks that indicate uh, the presence of aromaticity. So um, let's now have a look at what we've got. So our functional group is going to be COOH. So, moving on to part C, it says 25.0 centimetres cubed of an aqueous solution containing 8 grams per decimeter cubed of A requires 19.2 centimetres cubed of um, 0.2 MaOH for complete neutralisation. It says calculate the number of moles of MaOH needed to neutralise one mole of A and then suggest a structure for A consistent with all the data given. So, normally we'd use the data moles equation moles answer method. So inserting the data for the NaOH, we get 3.84 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. We know that uh, for every COOH group, there's one acidic proton. So OH uh, will react with that in a one-to-one -one ratio. So that would suggest uh, the same number of moles of COOH. Now, the only problem with that is we don't actually know how many COOH groups that A has. We're assuming at this point that it has one. But that's a bit shaky, because we would sort of do calculation to, to deduce that or prove it. 
So the answer part requires a bit more working. So it says calculate the number of moles of NaOH needed to neutralize one mole of A. So all it tells us about A is that it's uh, 8 grams per decimeter to the minus 3. So using the conversion on the screen, you can divide 8 by 104, which we got from our mass spectrum, which gives you 7.6923 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per decimeter to the minus 3. So taking that concentration, multiplying it by the volume of the sample of A, which is 25 centimeters cubed, gives us 1.923 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. And if we take the moles of sodium hydroxide to the moles of A, it gives us a 1 to 2 um, mole ratio uh, of uh, A to NaOH. So two moles of NaOH are needed. So if we've got two moles that are needed to completely neutralize one mole of A, the structure of A must contain two carboxylic acid groups. We also know it's going to be C3H4O4. So if we take two carboxylic acid groups away from C3H4O4, we then have CH2 left. So we can now propose a structure for C3H4O4. It's going to have two carboxylic acid. So using up two COOH groups leaves us with one carbon and two hydrogens. So the only way that this could work is to put CH2 between two carboxylic acids. Okay, so let's now go down to part uh, D, E, and F. So, um, I've taken away the mass spectrum because it was for A, and we've already worked out um, what A was. So it means we can also adjust um, our interpretation of part of the uh, infrared spectrum of A. There wasn't aromaticity after all, so I'm not going to say that's just the fingerprint region. Okay. So it says, give the structure for B. So it says B is formed when A, which is a carboxylic acid, reacts with ethanol, which is an alcohol. So this would suggest that B is an ester. So because A is a uh, dicarboxylic acid, I'm going to suggest that you have two ethanols and one A that come together to make an ester like that. Then the next one, part D, says give the structure for B. Sorry, part E, I beg your pardon. Give the structure for B. And uh, if we take our, our ester, it says that you need to think about hydrogens attached to carbon atoms which are adjacent to carbonyl groups can be removed by strong bases. So I've pointed out where two hydrogens can be removed. So that now means that, that gives us an, an ion. So ion C will have a lone pair, hence its negative charge. So it will behave as a nucleophile towards a haloalkane and will place the halogen in the nucleophilic substitution mechanism. So even though they don't actually ask for the mechanism, I'm going to do it for you anyway. So hopefully now you can introduce what you'd actually get. So you get compound D. So that circled part is from B. And the second circled part is from one bromobutane. So let's now have a look at part F. So, uh, taking the phenylbutazone from before, D reacts with E in a 1 to 1 mole ratio, 1 mole of phenylbutazone is made, and 2 ethanols. So let's have a think about what this might mean. So it should be quite easy to, to look at the phenylbutazone molecule and say that uh, the part that's circled or squared in purple is originally from D. As I've highlighted. So it shouldn't be too difficult to look at the drawing of D and see that the two uh, blue circled sections will end up as uh, two ethanols. So the bit now circled in dark blue must correspond to compound E. So I'll draw out compound E for you in dark blue so you can see the connection. 
So now what we can do is move on to the next part of this question. So this uh, next section wants the molecular formula for phenylbutazone, which we can give as C19H20N2O2. So the next uh, section asks us to think about five statements and which one or ones could explain the peak at 309. So a quick calculation of the MR of phenylbutazone reveals that it's 308 grams per mole to the minus 1 and not 309, so uh, statement I is not correct. Second is too obvious, because we know the molecule fragments in the mass spectrometer. The presence of one uh, carbon-13 atom would push the MR um, up to 309 grams per mole. The presence of one deuterium atom uh, would push the MR up to 310. So it's not that one either. But if we were to protonate one of the nitrogen atoms, that would definitely add one to the MR, making it 108, sorry, 308 grams per mole. So that would be um, a correct answer as well. So this next part introduces something called the McLafferty arrangement. What happens is uh, you get a, a fragmentation uh, and a molecular ion is created that uh, only occurs when there's a ketone group that has a hydrogen atom that's attached to a carbon three carbons away from the carbon ion carbon. So let's look at this next part, part I. It introduces something called the McLafferty arrangement. So you need to think about three carbons away from the ketone group. So I have uh, labelled them according to the diagram in the question. And now what I'm going to do is put in the curly arrows so you can see what's going on in terms of electron transfer. So that allows us to now deduce what the structure of the fragment at MZ252 is going to be. OK, so let's uh, pop along to the next page. So this next section, uh, still on phenylbutazone, actually requires some calculating. Because if you look at each section, each single pl pl uh, thing to do says calculate. So I'm just going to remind you of uh, some of the um, things from the front of the, of the paper, uh, your layout, your units, and your significant figures. So let's start with the, uh, the part J. It tells us that uh, it needs, uh, the human body needs 3.0 milligrams per kilogram of human body mass until um, phenylbutazone starts to, to produce a therapeutic dose. So taking the parts per billion as 4.0 times 10 to the minus 9, and 250 grams of the mass of one burger, that gives us the mass of phenylbutazone for every burger. So 3.0 milligrams is 3.0 divided by 1,000 in grams. So because 3.0... Um, divided by 1,000 times 75 would be the therapeutic dose for a 75 kilogram person. You'd need 0 0.225 grams. So to work out the number of burgers, you'd divide that by the mass of phenylbutazone in one burger. So that would give you a very tasty 225,000 burgers you'd have to eat. Right then, moving on swiftly, on to the uh, next part, part K. So this introduces the idea of using spectral photometry, and one common type of spectral photometry is uh, UV light, uh, or UV visible spectral photometry, where the effect of UV on the excitation of delocalized electrons within structures is explored. So this uh, azobenzene is an oxidation product of phenylbutazone, like it says in the question, and there's a large degree of delocalization between the two benzene rings via the nitrogen double bond nitrogen bridge. This is called an azo group. Now, this information you wouldn't have to work out for yourself, but I'm just giving it to you to give a little background. So this feature is made use of in spectral photometry because the UV light excites the delocalized electrons, meaning that energy can be absorbed in nanometers. This in turn allows us to plot a, con a calibration graph like you can see in the question. So the first thing to do here 
is to work out the concentration of azobenzene from a reading of uh, 0.997. So the absorbance is 0.997. So the answer will be based on graph reading, and I'm going to approximate it at about 10.1. So in 10 centimetres cubed of blood, there would be 10 times that amount, so 101 micrograms. So in the next part, they want you to calculate the mass of phenylbutazone that was oxidised. So we need the number of moles that were oxidised. So what we need to do is to use the MRs from the C3L6 periodic table. And I convert my micrograms into grams for my azobenzene, which gives me that amount of moles. So considering that the azobenzene and phenylbutazone have a one-to-one -one mole ratio, you can apply the same number of moles to phenylbutazone. Multiplying it by phenylbutazone's um, MR gives you 1.71021567310 to the minus 4 grams. So the next thing to do is to work out the concentration in moles per decimeter to the minus 3. So the above mass is in uh, 10 centimetres cubed, so scaling up by 100 you get the mass in 1 decimetre cubed. So if we take the, um, the number of moles as 5.542750521 times 10 to the minus 7 and times it by 100, that gives us 5.54 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimetre to the minus 3. So let's now move on to the final few qu um, questions from this section. So this section introduces carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. And the thing to be careful of here is the multiple examples of the same carbon environment as outlined in the label diagram of azobenzene. And this occurs quite a lot in symmetrical molecules. So starting you off on how I've worked out, there are four environments, and therefore four peaks. It shouldn't be too difficult to work out how many peaks are on the others using the symmetry idea. So part M wants you to predict the number of peaks in the carbon NMR spectrum of phenylbutazone. So starting with the two benzene rings, we can then move on. So it's going to be 10 peaks in total. So moving on to part N, it says when phenylbutazone is metabolized in the human body, it's changed in the liver to a molecule that has a mass spectrum with a molecular ion MZ324. So for part N, to work out the relative atomic mass of the missing atom, you just look at the difference between the MR of the metabolite and the MR of phenylbutazone. So it gives you 15.45, which is closest to oxygen. In the second part, what you've got to do is look at the number of extra carbon environments that you've got. And uh, the metabolite, with an extra oxygen, has five extra peaks compared to phenylbutazone. So the symmetry of one benzene ring is disrupted. So let's have a look at the phenylbutazone molecule. So by adding an OH group directly opposite the bond to nitrogen on one of the benzene rings, you create 15 carbon environments instead of 10. So a little bit of curiosity interest here. Um, in light of the answer to N part I, so oxygen is added, and it's added to phenylbutazone. Could it be oxyphenylbutazone? Well, close. Anyway, I think that takes us to the end of this question. It's been a bit of a long one, but it's gone through a lot of different topics. So if you're still with us, thanks a lot for sticking around for it. And uh, until next time, let's see you soon.